We will come to order. This is a hearing uh, Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority. Uh, is there a security gap? I want to welcome our uh, witnesses and I will um, I do not have much of an opening statement. I am primarily uh, here to listen. I want to uh, thank our witnesses again, especially our witnesses in public safety and law enforcement, because I realize you have uh, competing priorities. So thank you for being here. Uh, public safety is the preeminent responsibility of the federal government. As such, we're here today to examine the security of our nation's largest transit systems, one of our nation's largest transit systems, the Washington Area Metropolitan Transit Authority. Whether you're a Washington resident or a visitor from the 4th Congressional District in South Carolina, it's important that you uh, not only feel safe, but that you actually are safe. So I thank our uh, distinguished panel of uh, witnesses and uh, just a point of personal privilege whenever I see uh, uniforms. I want to thank uh, both the chiefs for your uh, public service. Um, I have a special place in my heart for law enforcement and public safety officers. So thank you. And with that, I would recognize the uh, gentleman from Illinois, ranking member, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for holding this hearing. I, too, would like to welcome the witnesses and thank them for coming. The events of September the 11th, 2001, brought the issue of transportation security and terrorism to prominence. Subsequent attacks in Moscow, London, and Madrid have further highlighted terrorism as a global threat to public transit. Transit security is especially challenging, due primarily to the very nature of the business. It's open accessible to the public with predictable routes and fixed access points. And more importantly, it's the transportation of choice for the masses in urban and metropolitan areas. Further, transit officials cannot employ many of the security strategies used in aviation. Transit does not allow the conventional security methods of X-ray machines, metal detectors, and pre-screening of passengers. I do not envy the balancing act that must take place, ensuring the safety, accessibility, and convenience of the transit system while also maintaining the attractiveness and reliability of the system. But it must be done and done well. So when people choose public transit, they should receive both a high degree of safety and security as well as convenience, all at an affordable cost. Today's hearings will look at all of these issues, but none more than security, the operation of a secure transit environment that spans multiple jurisdictions geographically, and that must integrate the specialties of multiple law enforcement agency depends upon interagency and jurisdictional coordination and cooperation. That can be hard to do without practice, superior communication, and rigorous oversight. I am interested today in learning from these witnesses just how they have accomplished and improved these tasks. Uh, WMATA, similar to transit systems across the country, are constantly evaluating and evolving with new procedures, techniques, and systems to increase security. Even in my home city of Chicago, the Chicago Transit Authority recently announced this week new security initiatives, a doubling of the amount of all angle security cameras across the rail system. And hopefully, this type of initiative deters crime as well as decreases opportunities for domestic or international terrorists to attack our country. WMATA, I am certain, has similar resources. So I am very interested in today's topic and greatly anticipate the testimony we will hear. Trans security is a timely and necessary topic. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and again, I thank the witnesses for coming and for their participation. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. The Chair would now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Cummings. I want to thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, for calling this hearing. As a member of both the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform and the Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure, I know how critical the metro system is to the Federal Government and to the entire metropolitan Washington region. As a youngster who depended on the bus to take me to a better school on the other side of Baltimore, I also know how critical 
public transit is to, as the Metro says, opening doors. I appreciate the opportunity today's hearing provides to consider security on the Metro system. This system serves 86 stations and carries more than half a million passengers every day. Given their openness, transit systems are inherently vulnerable to a variety of potential security threats. This is particularly true of the Washington Metro, which is such a uh, visible part of our nation's capital's infrastructure. It is cru critical that we understand the full range of threats confronting Metro, as well as any gaps that may exist in Metro's defenses. Effective security on the Metro requires a system to counter uh, threats of terrorism, but it also requires a system to protect passengers and system operators from other possible threats. I am deeply troubled by reports of violence against Metro bus drivers, and I want to understand what can be done to ensure driver safety. Given the threats that Metro and all transit systems in our nation face, it is inexplicable to me that the House appropriation for the Department of Homeland Security for fiscal year 2012, which provided funding for transit security programs, was less than half of the administration's requests. Republican leadership in the House has also proposed deep cuts across the board to other transportation programs. According to the Congressional Budget Office, maintaining the current funding baseline over the next six years for highway and transit programs would require $331 billion. The Republican budget would provide only $219 billion, cutting the investments in highway and transit programs by more than $100 billion. We simply cannot maintain our competitiveness as a nation by failing to make investments that enable us to build, maintain and protect our essential transportation infrastructure. And so, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses. I join you, Mr. Chairman, as you salute um, our public em employees and those in uniform. And that is very refreshing because I know you mean it. I, I, I've said it many times, so many times we have heard our public uh, employees uh, not treated uh, very fairly. And I was very glad to hear you say what you said because they, they do so much. They are the glue to keep our uh, nation together and keep our cities and our states together. And so, uh, again, I thank you. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. We will now welcome our first panel of witnesses. Uh, I will introduce you from my left to right, your right to left. I will introduce you. Um, at the same time, and then we will recognize you in that order for your uh, five-minute opening statement. Mr. Richard uh, Charles is the General Manager and Chief Executive Officer of the WMATA. Chief Michael Taborn is the Chief of the Metro Transit Police Department. Kathy uh, Lanier is the Chief of the Metropolitan Police Department. Mr. Anthony Griffin is the County Executive for the Fairfax County Government. Uh, pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses uh, must be sworn in before they testify, so I would respectfully ask you to please uh, rise and I will um, administer an oath. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Uh, many of you are more familiar with this process than I am, so uh, you will, should see a panel of lights. I am always reluctant to tell anyone who has a weapon or access to a weapon <laughs> that they have to stop talking, um, but you will notice the green, yellow, and red, and you may uh, do with that what you would traditionally do if you were driving with those. All right. Mr. Charles. Good, mo good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I am Richard Sarles, General Manager and CEO of the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, known as WMATA or Metro. Company me today is Metropolitan Transit Police Department Chief Michael Taborn. I am pleased to be here today to provide you with an update on the progress we are making at Metro in a number of critical areas, including safety, security, and returning our system to a state of good repair. I will begin by providing a short overview of Metro for those members who are not familiar with the system or new to the committee. Well, MATA was created in 1967 through an interstate compact between the Commonwealth of Virginia, the State of Maryland, and the District of Columbia, and approved by the U.S. Congress. Metro provides 1.2 million trips a day and is the second largest rail transit system and the sixth largest bus system in the United States. Americans from all over the nation depend on the system when visiting the capital, attending large national events. This unique role is why Metro is often referred to as America's subway. 
When your constituents visit Capitol Hill, Metro Rail provides safe and affordable transportation to see our nation's capital and visit your offices. Metro is also a critical homeland security asset and has demonstrated multiple times how important the system is in a time of crisis, such as evacuation from major weather events and national emergencies like 9-11. In particular, the Metro system is vitally important to getting Federal employees to our defense agencies such as the Pentagon and Department of Homeland Security. Approximately 40 percent of Metro's peak period customers are Federal employees. The Washington region was recently ranked the second most congested in the country. Without a doubt, we would be number one if not for the esti estimated half million automobiles that Metro Rail and Metro Bus take off the system. Whether you ride Metro Rail or drive your car, you benefit from the system. Metro also serves as a key driver of the economy, supporting both public and private investment, and has spurred over $37 billion in economic development at or adjacent to Metro property. In these difficult economic times, that development serves as a valuable source of revenue for our State and local partners. Now let me turn to Metro security preparedness. Metro Rail is by design an open system, as was mentioned earlier, which provides unique challenges when it comes to securing against potential threats. By design, it, was not, it, was, by design, it does not lend itself to an airport-style security system. Securing our system starts with an up-to-date threat assessment helping us determine how to most effectively use our personnel and resources and to prioritize our actions to best combat terrorism. Another important component of our security program is working each day in collaboration with the three jurisdictions and more than 40 law enforcement agencies in the National Capital Region, which enables us to share vital information and, when needed, added support for our security efforts. I want to thank both the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Transportation Security Administration and our local partner, Chief, Chief Lanier, for their support of Metro's Homeland Security Program. In addition to working to prevent acts of terrorism, we also have, to play, we have, also have, to play, have in place plans to help us quickly respond in the event of incidents like September 11th or an attack on our system. In this testimony, Chief Terry Bourne will provide you with even more detail on what Metro's police work to keep, how Metro's police work to keep Metro secure, but I would like to briefly touch on the topic of safety. Safety is our top priority at Metro. While serving as Interim General Manager and, and, as, and now as the Permanent CEO for the past five months, my personal goal has been to make sure that every employee at Metro puts safety first. Over the past 12 months, we have made great strides in addressing the recommendations of the NTSB and other agencies following the 2009 Fort Totten incident. The first billion dollars of our six-year, $5 billion capital rebuilding pro program is dedicated to addressing those NTSB recommendations. I want to especially recognize this committee for playing a key role in helping to rebuild Metro. Under the leadership of then -chair Committee Chair Tom Davis in 2008, Congress passed a 10-year, $1.5 billion authorization, the Passenger Rail Investment and Improvement Act, otherwise known as PREA, to address the capital needs of the WMATA system. The annual $150 million appropriation is the funding commitment Congress made in PREA as the Federal partner, matched by WMATA's jurisdictional partners, Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, for a total of $300 million a year. The $300 million represents almost 40 percent of our capital budget. Last year, in large measure due to the efforts of the Metro Congressional Delegation, we received the $150 million in PREA funding. Without PREA, the progress we have made will be at grave risk. In fact, we would slide backwards. What will happen if we do not receive our Federal funding in FY12? Let me be clear on this point. Safety will come first. We will use whatever funds we have available to assure that the system is safe. Everything else will be on the table. Unfortunately, our customers, your constituents, will bear the burden of cuts through more frequent train delays, less reliable trains and buses, deteriorated station conditions, longer lines, and delayed customer information. If our efforts are interrupted due to a lack of funding, it will ultimately affect both the safety and reliability of the system. Every day at Metro, we are making progress, but we have a long way to go. However, with the continued support of our customers, our jurisdictional partners, and Congress, we will get there. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Sorrells. Uh, Chief Tabor? 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Davis, and members of the subcommittee. I, too, thank you for the opportunity to come here to testify today. I'm Michael Taborn, Chief of the Metro Transit Police for the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, better known as WMATA or Metro. Mr. Sars has provided an overview of Metro. Now I would like to provide additional de details of our security programs. On June 4, 1976, President Gerald Ford signed into law a bill passed by Congress authorizing the establishment of the Metro Transit Police better known as MTPD. The MTPD is the only tri-jurisdictional police department in the United States operating in the District of Columbia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, and the State of Maryland. The department has an authorized strength of 450 sworn officers, 153 special police officers, 13 emergency management personnel, and 35 civilian personnel. The department police officers have law enforcement jurisdictions and arrest powers throughout the 1,500 square miles within the transit zone and responsible for crimes that occur in, on, or against the metro, metro rail, and all transit facilities. The Transit Police is a full-time, 24-7 law enforcement agency. Within the last year, Metro Transit Police has received approximately 60,000 calls for service, and approximately 339 of those calls we received just in the last six months that involved suspicious persons, packages, bomb threats, or similar events. Patrol officers are deployed throughout the system with duties that are most clearly associated with traditional police work. The department's largest contingent is comprised of foot patrol officers, followed by mobile patrol, metro bus enforcement, criminal investigations, and special operations. A year ago, the Metro Transit Police created the Metrostat to identify crime trends and hot spots, which allows us to strategically deploy our staff and resources most effectively. Using the Metrostat, information patrol commanders establish crime reduction objectives for their districts, monitor statistics and intelligence, then imply patrol tactics and or specialized equipment to address those identified needs. To be most effective in responding and preventing crime, we enlist the help of other regional law enforcement agencies and our own customers. Officers attend community meetings, promote public awareness campaigns, and often distribute crime prevention literature. The MTPD works aggressively with regional police departments such as Chief Lanier's, local schools, and youth organizations to prevent youth disorder in the system. With respect to our security mission, as Mr. Sauls mentioned, Metro, like the majority of mass transit systems in the United States, is by design an open system. Security strategies are complex and multi-layered. The Transit Police utilize many tools supported by a variety of local, state, and federal agencies to ensure our security strategies and policies facilitate accurate and timely operational readiness to any identified threat or vulnerability. Our overall strategy security approach combines the use of technology with enhanced operational awareness and puts an emphasis on training, public awareness outreach efforts, emergency preparedness, and the use of various security assessments that take into consideration the unique designs of our transit system. Through the Washington Metropolitan Area Council of Governments Police Chief Subcommittee, the MTP meets regularly with, again, over 40 law enforcement agencies in the National Capital Region to address current and emergency law enforcement issues excuse me, and tends to exchange information and ideas about the delivery of public safety. Further, the committee facilitates appropriate dialogue to enhance regional security and anti-terrorism efforts and plans for the safe and effective transportation of millions of passengers to the national level events, such as the inauguration of the President of the United States, July 4th fireworks, National Cherry Blossom Festivals, Marine Corps marathons, and sports and entertainment events. To help coordinate law enforcement efforts uh, with our federal partners, the Metro Transit Police has an officer assigned to the FBI Local Joint Terrorism Task Force, the National Joint Terrorism Task Force with Chief Lanier's Washington Regional Threat and Analysis Center, and the Transit Police have taken aggressive steps to combat the threat of terrorism and partnered with the Federal Transit Administration and the Transportation Security Administration. Officers use a variety of high visibility uniform patrol techniques, technology, equipment, and national security initiatives to assist in preventing terrorism. WMATA's security inspection program was launched in December of 2010, which is a tactic also used in transportation environments to effectively target prevention of terrorist activity. The SIP, which is called, is modeled after successful programs currently in use by transit properties in the United States, including those in New Jersey, New York, and Boston. The purpose of the screening is to detect any explosive material and prevent it from being brought into the metro system. In 2009, WMATA's anti-terrorism team, ATT, was created through a transit security grant 
The team is comprised of 20 sworn police officers who provide high visibility patrols focused on protecting transportation patrons and employees. The ATT team works closely with the Federal Air Marshals and the Transportation Security Administration to develop new strategies and techniques for combating acts of terror. Team deployment objectives include identification of system vulnerabilities, high visibility patrol, surveillance and counter surveillance operations and investigation of suspicious activity, persons or packages. The authority has made great strides in the utilization of technology to harden WMATA's infrastructure. Uh, physical security enhancements including lighting, fencing, access control, intrusion detection systems, bollards, guard booths at rail and bus facilities, the program response options and technology enhancements for chemical terrorism, better known as PROTECT, system is capable of detecting selected groups of chemical warfare agents within a predetermined threshold at metro stations. Simply put, PROTECT and its command and control software offers information to chemical incident operations disciplines to make more informed response decisions. Currently, we have over 7,000 cameras throughout the system. 81 percent of those cameras are operational. We also use customer communications in our stations, vehicles and facilities to raise awareness and remind the public to report any suspicious behavior to the police. On any given day, WMATA patrons uh, hear a variety of safety and security related messages, including announcements by myself and by Department of Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano, whose announcement seeks the assistance of transit riders in identifying suspicious persons or packages in the nationally recognized, if you see something, say something campaign. Transit riders also witness high visibility patrols in collaboration with many local, state and federal partners. Uh, since 2006, Congress has appropriated approximately $1.6 billion in transit security grant funds to help local transit authorities such as Metro to get trained personnel, participate in exercises and raise public awareness and protect critical infrastructure. I'll close. Uh, the remaining funds are, are fully obligated in the sense that we have received to date $108 million in transit security grant funds. In my written testimony, we have provided detailed information on the challenges faced in spending those dollars as quickly as possible. We are working internally at Metro to expedite those processes. In addition, we have provided bipartisan leadership of the House and Senate Homeland Security Committee input on what changes need to be made in the legislation that created the grant program to streamline DHS grant programs. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide you this overview of our efforts to keep Metro safe and secure, and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you, Chief uh, Taborn. Uh, Chief Lanier. Good morning, Chairman Gowdy, members of the committee, Congresswoman Norton, uh, staff and guests. I appreciate the opportunity to present this statement on behalf of the Metropolitan Police Department on our collaborative efforts with our federal, state and local partners to address the security in our metro system. Today I will provide an overview of how MPD works with Metro on not only homeland security issues, but also highlights the joint efforts that we have to address crime and public safety. Uh, it's relevant to all of us. Obviously, mass transportation is one of the most attractive targets for anyone wanting to disrupt a major city. The TSA's Office of Intelligence concurs that mass transit and passenger rail systems are viable targets for a terrorist attack. An attack on a passenger rail system would garner attention not only because of the damage and casualties, but also because it could disrupt daily operations of a major metropolitan area for an extended period of time. As rail systems are easily accessible to the public and difficult to secure, they are extremely vulnerable to attacks that we have seen overseas. Since 2004, there have been four major attacks on mass transit in Moscow, Mumbai, London and Madrid, with almost 500 total fatalities and more than 3,000 people injured. Given the possibility of an attack on Metro and the impact it would have on the district and the entire region, it is important to review how authorities in the national capital region work together to safeguard the transit system. Clearly, all of the law enforcement agencies in this region play a critical role in securing our transit and rail systems. Although we are often thought of as first responders, our most critical role is prevention through detection and deterrence. Through a robust suspicious activity reporting, we are uniquely positioned to detect and prevent terrorist incidents right here at home. Information provided by local police and very often the community, if discovered early and matched with the right intelligence, can help detect, dis disrupt and prevent a terrorist plot. Recognizing that information sharing is critical in both preempting and responding to an attack, MPD maintains daily contact not only with Metro Transit and Amtrak Police um, in our um, fusion center through the intelligence analysts that are co-located with other partners around the region. In addition to tracking operational law enforcement activity and identifying emerging, threat, emerging threats in the fusion center, 
MPD is also engaged in the Department of Homeland Security's pilot project of the Trapwire. It's a predictive software system. This system supports the use of our suspicious activity reporting to detect patterns of pre-attack surveillance and logistical planning. Beyond that, the flow of information among federal, state, and local partners through our Joint Terrorism Task Force is excellent in the nation's capital. Our agencies have worked together for many years, sharing information and coordinating responses to a variety of situations and the many special events that take place in the nation's capital. In addition to the pre-established relationships of the members of the task force, the area chiefs of police meet on a monthly basis to address regional issues, including rail safety, through the Council of Governments. MPD also facilitates a weekly intelligence meeting with a number of our key partners that includes Metro Transit, the FBI, Secret Service, United States Capitol Police, United States Park Police, Amtrak Police, as well as the DC Fire and EMS. These meetings provide a forum for us to share critical information and sensitive law enforcement operations, as well as classified intelligence. As real-time information is critical in the event of a major incident, the MPD is in the process of integrating real-time computer-aided dispatch information with not only Metro Transit Police, but other law enforcement agencies around the region to enhance our situational awareness. From an operational perspective, the MPD actively participates in Metro Transit's Terrorism Identification and Deterrence Effort, or Blue Tide, through coordinated patrols in and around metro stations. As a part of these patrols, MPD's bomb unit conducts regular sweeps to detect explosive materials, including unattended packages, which have the potential to store IEDs. MPD also participates in similar programs on Operation Rail Safe, which provides enhanced patrols in and around our commuter rail hubs. With so many police departments working in the region, coordinated information sharing and response planning is essential. Even beyond the National Capital Region, MPD has been participating in the Northeast Corridor Coalition since 2005. This consortium of police and transit agencies work together to enhance security planning and programming along the Amtrak rail between Washington, D.C. and Boston. This planning includes response for active shooter scenarios as well as chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear, or explosive attacks. MPD and Metro Transit have a strong relationship that is grounded in a history of mutual support. From sharing crime information around Metro platforms to responding to events occurring in the transit system or overlapping are overlapping jurisdictions that require efficiency and collaborative responsibilities. For major events occurring in the District of Columbia, WMATA has been quick to offer services such as buses for cooling centers, blockades, and transportation. During the school year, Metro Transit Police participate in a daily conference call with MPD to ensure situational awareness regarding the safe transport of our students after school. MPD also assist, assist, has assisted Metro in metering large crowds at uh, busy stations like Gallery Place and providing traffic control during incidents uh, and coordinating criminal investigations. While all the joint exercises and coordinated efforts have worked well to build relationships and enhance operational effectiveness, the best example of our joint efforts occurred on June 22, 2009, when nine people were killed as a result of a collision on Metro's red line. This tragic incident required the coordinated response of numerous agencies. The district's fire EMS quickly coordinated a unified command which delineated the roles and response of the, all the responding agencies. The quick response and communications between law enforcement and first responders led to the determination very quickly that the event was not related to a crime or an act of terrorism. MPD immediately set up our Joint Operations Command Center to serve as an area command for police resources and practice protocols were quickly implemented. Security perimeters were established this, on the scene to identify responders and restrict unauthorized personnel, and a rotation schedule was established to ensure relief of personnel. This was a three-day operation. Radio communications and external communications with the media operated in strict accordance with the National Incident Management System and Incident Con Command System procedures. This incident exemplified proficient efforts in the responding agencies in dealing with disasters of this magnitude. Ultimately, why much collaboration has continued has and continues to take place, it's imperative that relative partner agencies continue to train, exercise, and share information on a daily basis in order to effectively respond to any future scenario. I can assure you that the MPD remains committed to this process. Once again, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in the hearing today, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chief Lanier. Mr. Griffin. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and members of the subcommittee. I am Anthony H. Griffin, County Executive, Fairfax County, Virginia, a position that I have had the privilege of holding since January 2000. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today on the security challenges facing the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority, otherwise referred to as WMATA. 
My comments are formed from two perspectives. First, as CEO of the largest jurisdiction in the region by population and as Director of Emergency Management as set by the Code of Virginia. Second, as co-chair of the decision-making process for the National Capital Region since the inception of the Urban Area Security Initiative grants until the conclusion of 2010, or seven grant cycles. Additionally, I served as chair of the Chief Administrative Officers Committee at the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments, other, otherwise referred to as COG, for 10 years. Based on my own experience, the five existing rail stations in Fairfax County, a shared bus facility, and having consulted with my police and fire chiefs, I can say that the relationship between Fairfax County and WMATA from a public safety perspective is very strong. WMATA is an active participant with the Chiefs Committee at COG and is present when security issues are discussed on a regional basis. On a police operational level, collaboration and coordination is good, whether with a specific district station or with the county specialty units such as SWAT, K-9, or EOD, when there is a need for a station sweep or for high visibility. WMATA regularly communicates fire system status updates and when there are upgrades to equipment or modifications to stations. Fairfax County has regularly participated in large-scale multi-jurisdictional exercises with WMATA with a focus on rail security and safety. In summary, there is a strong professional relationship between WMATA and the county's public safety agencies, and I personally have worked well with the senior management of WMATA. As previously noted, WMATA is an active participant when discussing how preparedness in the National Capital Region can be improved, and the UASI grant process has been a major facilitator. It has been accepted by the participants that transportation is a key issue when considering threats and mitigation. Rail facilities and stations are recognized as potential targets, and rail is integral to being able to move a significant percentage of the region's population during a time of crisis. WMATA has access to other Federal grant programs specifically oriented to transit security and safety. However, the CAOs or the Chief Administrative Officers and the Senior Policy Group, the representatives from the Governors, have agreed that WMATA should be a funding recipient, recipient because its security requirements exceeded its normal resources. Consequently, in addition to the NCR localities receiving and managing subgrants, WMATA was allocated funds for specific projects which would enhance its security and its ability to respond to emergencies. I have attached a list of the projects and the amount of money assigned. Is there a security gap? In my experience with public safety, there are never enough resources, whether it is with my own agencies or with WMATA. My job and our jobs is to prioritize the risk and to manage the resources available to the greatest effect and benefit. In my opinion, based on my exposure to the subject and WMATA, I believe that WMATA has done a good job with the resources available, but that if there were more resources available, it would help narrow the gap. I should note there will always be a gap, but I believe continued vigilance and effort will tilt the odds in favor of WMATA and the public safety agencies. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the privilege to speak. I will be pleased to respond to the committee's questions. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Uh, at this point, the chair would recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to thank all of the witnesses. Uh, Chief Tabor, WMATA's security program consistently ranks among the top 20 percent of transit systems nationwide as measured by TSA inspectors using the baseline assessment and security enhancement program base. However, I know that items such as fully operational cameras at all stops are still lacking. So could you discuss some security needs that might exist or challenges that uh, you think need some additional attention? Well, thank you very much, sir. And we are very grateful for the federal government, the Department of Homeland Security, TSA, the Federal Transit Administration for all the support that they have provided to Metro over the course of many years. Many of those items that you talked about, cameras, uh, we have a 35-year-old system, and it wasn't until 
10 years ago when our second police officer was killed in the line of duty that those cameras did not have the capability of recording. As we have gone through the years, we have sought out grants to enhance our camera capabilities, and those are the steps that we are taking now. Uh, we have cameras that recently, through the UASI process, have identified 86 Metro Rail stations, so we'll have the opportunity through um, sharing with jurisdictional partners to see those types of things. But we are in the process of working with the general manager and the new leadership to seek funds to provide more cameras in our systems. Uh, we know that cameras aren't always the solutions, but they aid in investigations or telling us what's going on in any particular period of time. Thank you very much. I, I know that you were instrumental in developing transit security protective measures that have been adopted nationwide. Can you tell us about anti-terrorism training that your officers receive and how often are these drills uh, conducted? Again, as a response to the events of 9-11, initially before the birth of the Department of Homeland Security, there was a $23.5 million Department of Defense grant that was given to the Federal Transit Administration to go out and do an assessment of transit properties all over the United States. Part of that involved three basic premises enhance employee training, emergency preparedness, and public awareness. And part of that training was a spinoff from that, the Terrorist Activity Recognition and Reaction Program that was given to transit agencies across the country, the BAS beha Behavioral Assessment Training Program that was spearheaded by the Transportation Security Administration. And it affords not only police officers but frontline employees what to look for from a terrorist standpoint. And so, as typified by the event in uh, Times Square where a person saw something and said something, those are the types of things that we encourage both our employees as well as our riders to report something that may not be a big deal but may be the key to investigating crime. So training is something that continues to happen. TSA has a very good training program, the National Transit Institute through funding from FTA has a great training program, and it's getting this type of training through transit agencies across the country. And how often are, are your officers evaluated? We uh, provide training every year. Uh, we are in the process now of providing training to all of our frontline employees, over 7,000 employees, for metro emergency response training to familiarize them not only with uh, terrorist tactics, but what to do in a, in, a, in a case of an emergency. So that training is ongoing, and as new people come on the department, come on to the agency, we do a repetitive uh, requirement to provide that training. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, would the Chairman yield for unanimous consent request? Yes, sir. I know, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for your graciousness. I'm not a member of the subcommittee, but a member of the full committee. I have a statement um, I'd like to enter into the record uh, as a longtime supporter of Metro. Uh, expressing uh, my support for management endeavors to enhance uh, public safety and to encourage the federal government to do its fair share in support of the same. Uh, without objection, and thank you for being here. We are delighted to have you with the subcommittee. I thank the chair. Uh, to our witnesses, our guests, uh, and uh, my colleagues who um, are probably as uh, aware, if not more aware than I am, votes have been called. Uh, I think it's a very short series. Uh, here's the pledge I will make to you. Uh, we will sprint to the Capitol <laughs> to vote. Uh, we may walk briskly. We will go as quickly as we can to the Capitol and vote because we want to be good stewards of your time. Um, I'm coming back the second I cast my vote. I, I know that other colleagues will as well. As well. This is a very important hearing. So. Uh, Mr. Davis has graciously offered to buy any of you drinks or something to eat if you want it during the break. We're, go we're going to come back. If it happens again, I won't make you do it again. But if you would indulge us to go vote and come back, I, I would be very grateful. And if it happens again, I won't ask you to do it again. So we will be in recess pending votes. Thank you.
On behalf of all of us, thank uh, the witnesses and the guests for your indulgence uh, as we voted. And at this point, the chair would recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've just got some some uh, some background checks and our questions, uh, Mr. Sarles. When we're looking at um, uh, doing background checks, do we also do uh, what kind of protocol do we have for monitoring our force? Um, uh, periodically, you know, I think uh, one of the things we've learned in some of our um, uh, homeland security issues is that we may have had somebody come by, come through, and and have a different background uh, than they profess to be. Where, what kind of progress do we have for monitoring, particularly like maintenance, all our different types of employees? Basically, when they're hired, we have background checks. Uh, with regard to uh, bus operators, we do checks on driver CDLs uh, to make sure that uh, they are uh, continue to continue to maintain their license. Also, with regard, we have a lot of contractors working on the uh, site, so we have uh, checks on that that we do. Uh, I think it's basically every two years. Is that right, Chief? Yes. Uh, yeah. Every year, uh, background checks on them. So that's the extent that we do it today. Is that mandatory by compliance from the the contractor uh, head, um, or is there random um, review, uh, Chief? You can answer as well. Okay, many of the um, guidelines and and recommended practices that came by way of either TSA or FTA talks about background checks, and it's something that's not mandatory, but we embrace that and we do it on a yearly basis for all contractors. Uh, bus operators, as indicated by Mr. Sauls, or train operators, their driver's license, their criminal records, we want to check that to make sure that they are not uh, uh, have a criminal charge or a traffic violation that prevents them from delivering good quality service. Well, I know that uh, when we reviewed the TSA, we have some concerns about um, some of the folks uh, in delivery, maintenance, that aspect, because we've got a number of access points that mm, nah, don't really we're more reactive than we're proactive. Um, and, and I want to know more about um, where you would go with that. Um, um. Again, uh, probably the whole universe of our uh, operations, 8,000 employees, we on a probably every two weeks do a records check. So we know if someone is uh, wanted for a particular crime. Uh, as part of their employment, initial employment, they go back and they look at 10 years. But on a consistent basis, we run uh, the checks of our employees, both traffic and criminal, probably about every two to three weeks. Do we review um, how the systems actually work themselves, how people infiltrate um, a system? Um, I guess it's more review. I mean, as a business owner, there's always, you know, we have an employee, we bring them in, we always have a six-month review. Um, sometimes we'll actually have another review from another employee, you know, those kind of things for monitoring because it's, you know, just a background check some is not going to catch everything. Mm -hmm. Well, from the standpoint of our contractors, we do it on a yearly basis. For our employees, as I indicated, about every three weeks we do a check. Um, sometimes, uh, depending upon the jurisdiction, if they left this area, we don't do a nationwide check. We do the jurisdictional checks, Maryland, Virginia, or the District of Columbia, or if, in fact, they live in Pennsylvania, something like that. In a protocol, if you have a suspicious activity, what would be your normal protocol if you had somebody with suspicious activity or well, again, a, a warning light? Again, we, we, we partner with the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force, so if there's any suspicious activity that rises to that level that sort of borders on terrorism, we will immediately let them know, again, we have a person the same as uh, Kathy Lanier and Trapwire, that that information is put in there. and so. If there's a possibility that there's a hit or somebody has additional information, we all in law enforcement would know about it. And, and last question, um, how do we involve um, uh, the public? How do we um, go about in improving that relationship because the public, I mean, we can't catch everything. Um, we need the public's insight here. And how do we keep them involved and, and constantly uh, take their, their proactive ideas? Good. If you go back, uh, the basis of the see something, say something had its birth in Transit Watch and was similar to Neighborhood Watch where uh, messages, where things were delivered to transit properties, uh, uh, New York 
took, if you see something, say something. Others adopted, is that your bag, or see it, say it. And so those were slogans that sort of embraced the public into the security and protecting themselves while they're in public transportation. And there are a host of initiatives. I think I was with Chief Lanier when the Secretary Napolitano uh, launching the See Something, Say Something, because it has application not just in transit, but in all types of sectors. So if we see something suspicious, we want to notify the authorities so actions can be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gozar. The chair at this point would recognize the general lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the witnesses for very helpful testimony, and I especially want to thank you, Chairman Gowdy, uh, for uh, today's uh, hearing on uh, a matter of great importance to the federal government because of the importance of WMATA to the federal government. Uh, um, I, I'm not sure all of us were here, but in the winter of 2009 and 2010, uh, the federal government, it, government it, itself shut down, and the major reason was because WMATA shut down. Um, in, I think it was 2008, Congress uh, did something with respect to WMATA it would never do for any other regional or local system. Uh, it uh, authorized uh, $1.5 uh, billion for capital repairs of, of WMATA. Um, this was done um, when um, my good friends on the other side were in charge. I do want to uh, read what uh, this committee said at the time, uh, at least in part. Metro bus and rail service plays an indispensable role in the day-to-day -day operations of the federal government. Uh, and then the committee went on to speak, speak of private citizens who, who have business with the government who depend upon WMATA about the uh, matters of state um, and concluded, thus, Metro is a national as asset in which all Americans have an interest. Well, the Congress did come to that conclusion, and it's interesting that the, we had difficulty getting the, the funds out. We got the first $150,000 installment only after nine, nine people were killed in the tragic um, metro accident, uh, as it turns out, about two years ago uh, this week. Um, now. You have indicated that, Mr. Sarles, that if you do not receive the $150,000 this, this year, that would be the third installment, uh, that you would not let safety uh, slip and that you would take everything else away or as much of it as you could in order to, to keep keep the, um, the, 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 the keep Metro safe, and I'm sure you would, but I'm not sure the committee understands what you are doing and what we mean by keep it safe. Um, would you be able, for example, to keep on track for the repairs and rehabilitation necessary to make this a safe line? For example, the accident involved cars from the 1970s, which are obsolete, but which you have no alternative but to use. So you are still using, are you not, the 1970s vintage cars uh, the, where virtually all those who died were killed? And what are you going to do? What would be your priorities? Would you be able to be on track even if you pulled all the funds away? Describe to us what the work is all about. Okay. With regard to the $150 million a year, that matched with the local contribution of $150 million is $300 million a year, which is nearly 40 percent of our budget. If we lost that, uh, it would, as I said, cause us to slide backwards. We would still proceed with the purchase of those cars for replacement. That's How many of you? There's 300 uh, cars to be replaced. Uh, those are the oldest cars. Yeah, how many have been purchased so far? We've, we, we've placed the order for the 300 plus some others uh, cars. So no, none of those cars has been replaced as of yet? No. They are being uh, designed right now with manufacturer Kawasaki in Nebraska. 
Um, and then we start taking delivery, to, delivery of them in 2013. But if we lost 40 percent of our capital budget, I said we'd still operate safely. That doesn't mean we'd operate reliably. Um, for instance, we would not be able to do the track reconstruction. You know, we're dealing with tracks that are rails that are 30, 35 years old. Um, we would not replace them. And what happens when you don't replace them is you have to operate at slower speeds. Uh, so we'd slow down the system. Uh, you would also, we'd find ourselves doing a lot more daily inspections and finding problems, which would mean there'd be interruptions during the, even the peak periods if we have to go in and make a quick fix to keep the railroad running. The same thing is true of buses. Uh, we've been able to, uh, over the last several years, buy enough buses to get the uh, bus system in shape, at least with regard to the age of the buses, uh, we would have to stop buying those. Uh, as a result, the buses would get older and older and they'd break down and they, the service that we provide to our bus co customers would deteriorate. When you don't do the reconstruction, it means that you have more breakdowns, you operate more slowly because it, in order to keep it safe, and ultimately, uh, we've seen, we have seen tragically what has happened when there wasn't enough funding for this system. Is my time expired? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I thank the general lady from the District of Columbia. The chair at this point would recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And thank the witnesses for their appearance today. Chief uh, Tabarn, in uh, news, news reports have highlighted an increase in crime at the Prince George's County uh, metro stops. In fact, uh, six of the top ten metro stations with the highest crime rates in the D.C. metropolitan area were in Prince George's County. Can you detail what is being done to curb this, this crime? Sure. Um, in the 86 stations, we have many stations that are end of the line stations, and that's where we have the larger parking facilities, whether it's garages or parking lots. 75% of the crimes that occur on the metro are crimes against property, so whether it's still in the GPS, the catalytic converter, or seeing change uh, in the car and breaking the window, still in that. Those are the types of crimes that we see most in the outlying jurisdictions, and in particular, Prince George's County. What we've done is worked with uh, Interim Chief McGow and reached out to his uh, department, Prince George's County. Uh, the general manager met back in April with 17 of the local jurisdictional law enforcement leaders or, or their representatives and talked about the crimes in and around the entire jurisdictions and specifically those that we had seen an elevation in crime. And we got a commitment from those chiefs to do as much as they possibly could do. One of the solutions was to provide them with a smart trip card so that their offices on patrol as they go into the parking lots, they could go whenever they're doing a patrol, have access to that, and when you increase the visibility of law enforcement, there's a probability that those people who are violating the crime, committing those crimes will uh, be reduced. We also have, as uh, Chief Lanier indicated, Blue Tide, where we partner on a quarterly basis with law enforcement throughout the National Capital Region and show a combined effort, whether it's in Montgomery County, Prince George's County, the District of Columbia, and we show that we're there to support. And those types of efforts are those that we advocate and uh, jointly participate in collaborations. Thank you for that response. And Chief Lanier, um, I, I want to say it was last year at the uh, Lon Font Station or one of the Southwest stations, there was a group of uh, young people that were attacking passengers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, the public saw some of the disturbing video. Uh, has that been curtailed as far as these roving groups of young people that attack passengers indiscriminately? Uh, I can speak to the, the cases that uh, I'm aware of that have occurred kind of uh, entrance into the metros and around the metros. And yes, we've been very successful. Gallery Place was another place where we saw large groups of young people who came down, particularly um, evenings and weekends, um, that were um, creating all kinds of havoc around the train. Um, we worked jointly with Metro to put together 
kind of a crowd metering system uh, experience we learned in some of the larger special events here to kind of separate and meter those groups into the into the transit stations a little bit um, a little bit carefully uh, to keep those groups that are looking to start trouble with other groups separated, and that really has made a big difference, uh, and particularly around the Gallery Place Metro. I know we still have had some disturbing incidents, though. There's a, a lot of uh, young people that come from all over the region that just are um, using the Metro as a way to carry out their bad behavior. And, and have there been a, a arrests made as far as from, from officers uh, witnessing some of this activity? Are you all go looking at video? I'd have to defer to yeah, Chief the, the case that you're making reference to that happened at LaFont Plaza. We did, in fact, arrest the young lady, a female, approximately 15 years of age. Uh, she uh, was found guilty and she was sentenced. And uh, we have other uh, situations that we utilize the videos or any type of information that is provided to us, and we do uh, a concerted effort to investigate all of the sources, and we visited many schools that uh, uh, these young people were attending, and based upon that type of collaboration with the Metropolitan Police Department, we were able to identify this young lady, and she subsequently uh, admitted her uh, involvement in this, and again, she was sentenced. Okay. Um, thank you both for your responses. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri. Uh, one of the, uh, the core functions of the federal government, obviously, is national security and national defense, one of the core functions of state government, at least in my state, education is in the, is in the Constitution and, and public safety is near and dear to my heart as well and it's also a core function of government and I, I, I feel the pain of, of the budget debates. Um, I can tell you in South Carolina being married to a public school teacher, um, it was tough last year um, watching our, our friends be furloughed and as a a prosecutor having to furlough uh, your employees in your office for five to seven days without pay and then watch your sheriff uh, have to furlough deputies, uh, it's tough because if you can't spend money on public safety and national security, it makes you wonder where you're spending money. But at some point after the debate is over about our fiscal straits, uh, you all still have to do the job. And uh, so I guess what I'm asking is, aside from the resources which my colleagues have so aptly uh, and ably asked you about, aside from the resources, is there anything else Congress can do? Is there anything else we can do to help you uh, do your jobs better? Uh, I understand the budget part and the finance part. Is there anything else we can do? Well, I, 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 everything kind of centers around finance, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, I'll just say from from my perspective, um, I've been here 21 years in Washington, D.C., so I've been here throughout the uh, Metro's um, development and watching the population in Washington, D.C. and the region continue to grow and watching the shifts in um, economic development and the crime patterns that go along with that. Um, crime patterns um, traditionally follow transportation, whether it be major roadways or trains or, or what it is. Um, we've been really successful driving crime down in the city Unfortunately, our success is creating issues for Metro because um, when you're really successful at pushing the kind of the hardcore uh, committed uh, folks that are committed to com crime, um, they're going to go the easiest place to, to get their, carry out their crimes and, uh, and get away. And Metro makes it difficult to police. I can't imagine how um, Chief Taborn does his job with the size of the force that he has. I was at um, Pentagon... Um, last week with a chief over there, uh, Pentagon Force Protection Uniform Police Department has 850 officers. Um, they are not subject to the volume of 911 calls. They're not subject to the, you know, um, typically the ridership in Metro is almost the population of the District of Columbia. Um, I can't imagine how Chief Taborn polices that Metro. It's geography that moves. Um, it's very difficult. And so I don't know what's always the politically correct thing to say when we're, we're here testifying, but I know that he probably won't say it, but I'll say it for him. I think he needs more police officers. I really, really do. It, you know, we work together and we try and help with that challenge, but um, police officers in those train stations and on those platforms not only make people feel a lot safer, but they will be safer. So that's my two cents. Well, Chief Taborn, Chief Letter, I, you know, 
this is such a different world that that we're living in. At least uh, those of us up here who grew up uh, in different times. There, one of the beautiful things about the summertime in Washington is the influx of young people either working in my colleagues' offices or working for committees or just visiting the nation's capital. And you stop and think what this current crop of young people has seen from Columbine to Timothy McVeigh to 9-11 to shootings in schools. And it's a world that I didn't grow up in. I grew up with the garden variety stealing and shoplifting and that kind of crime. It's a, it's a different world. My colleagues have addressed the national security part. For the garden variety assaults, and you mentioned uh, property damage, are you getting the prosecutorial support that you want? Are the crimes being taken seriously? And I say that with some trepidation as a former prosecutor, what the answer may be. But are, are, you, are you, is safety that doesn't amount to something uh, cataclysmic and horrible being taken safety and uh, being taken uh, seriously in your judgment? Well, I think in response to your question, uh, those crimes that involve crimes against person, persons, we do get a lot of support. Those other crimes that may involve fair evasion, disorderly conducts, uh, spitting, eating, drinking, doing a lot of the smaller things, our officers make the stop, they write the citations, they go to court, and more often than not, those cases are not prosecuted. And so what that does in operating under constraints with the budget is that we pay overtime when we send an officer to court. Uh, and so when there's no follow-up, and we have not even talked about the juveniles, because juveniles, you either issue them a warning citation or you do a custodial uh, arrest. And, um, they now know that there's not going to necessarily be follow-up if you issue them a citation. And so that is an area that we could seek some improvement. We would also like to improve uh, the grant process to assist us with getting dollars back in the Transit Security Grant Program and to look at the flexibility of those grants. We know that the Department of Homeland Security focuses on terrorism, but many of the crimes that happen in the subway uh, we may not be able to get funding to uh, attack that, but if we attack the regular day-to-day -day crime, the spinoff is that it's going to make it diff difficult for a terrorist to commit any other crime. So uh, the funding of an explosive canine, as an example, that will be funded, but a regular patrol dog will not be funded. And so we often ask, and we'll be asking uh, TSA next week when we meet with the top 50 transit chiefs in Denver, to see if, in fact, there is some flexibility in the grant so that we cover the whole universe of security. Thank you, Chief. Uh, to my colleagues, given the seriousness of the issue and the fact that our witnesses were gracious enough to wait on us, if, if anyone's interested in a, I guess we'll call it a, a lightning round, if anyone wants to ask a couple of follow-up questions, uh, uh, the, gentleman, the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank you for your indulgence. I've just got uh, one question I'd like to do a little follow-up on the whole question of background checks. And I'd like to ask a hypothetical question, uh, basically because I am concerned that we don't deny individuals the opportunity to re-enter the workforce or to regain acceptance back into society after they have uh, been convicted of criminal violations. If a person, say, if, if a person had gotten caught with enough marijuana 13 years ago to be arrested and convicted, come back under the 10-year rule depending on what the transgression may have been, would that person be eligible for employment uh, with the agency? I'd really have to get back to you with that, the specific answer on that. Uh, we tried to balance uh, what the crimes were against what the person is being asked to do. So I'd have to get back to you with a more specific answer on that. Thank you very much. I would appreciate that because I, I've run into so many instances where there was blanket denial. And then when you do a little check-in, you find out that the individual may have 
done something uh, that he or she would actually pose no threat at all to anything, but their record is there and they're denied an opportunity. So I would very much appreciate uh, an answer to that question. Thank you very much. Ms. Holmes Norton, Mr. Clay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just one question. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask it. After all, this is a, a committee consisting of members from throughout the country. Um, and my question really has to do with the effect of the Red Line Metro crash uh, on other parts of the country. Most of us did not know, I do not believe I knew until the crash, that there were no national rail standards. Uh, I was astonished because I'm accustomed to safety standards in every other mode of transportation. No one would think of getting on, a, on an airplane uh, if they thought that there weren't, with that every uh, every city could do its own <laughs> standards. This is the very essence of of interstate commerce. Now, obviously, these trains don't always go across state lines the way the way ours do. But um, the Congress, in the wake of uh, this uh, historic um, crash that so alarmed the country, um, many many of us introduced a bill. And it's reintroduced this year that would require the Department of Transportation to develop uh, national rail standards. Now, local jurisdictions could have their own standards if those standards were consistent with national standards. They wouldn't have to be enforced uh, by the Department of Transportation, or they could ask the Department of Transportation to take on that task. Uh, I ask this question, Mr. Sauls, because we're fortunate that you have led two uh, major transit uh, systems. I, I, I'd like to know whether you think national rail standards uh, would have would help improve the um, safety of metro and other uh, rail transit uh, agencies or uh, around the, the the country, and if so, how and why? Um, in fact, in my last position, we uh, ran commuter rail, which is is governed by federal regulation, the FRA. Uh, I welcome that. Um, I, I think it's good to have uh, national standards. It helps in... Uh, so computer rail here in the district... A commuter rail here would have FRA regulations. So the, they would be governed by national standards. Right. Uh, you're from, is it New Jersey? From New Jersey, right. Uh, New Jersey so Trans part of what you... <laughs> Part of what you had jurisdiction over were governed by national standards. Right. How did you do the rest? Well, we had a, a state oversight uh, uh, com commission or committee uh, which um, oversaw the light rail lines. Uh, we worked well with them. I will say that as the, an operator, the primary responsibility is for safety. Primary responsibility for safety rests with us. But it's excellent to have oversight because you never see everything. Nor well, you have some oversight. You know, each, yes. uh, you don't have the same standards, though. So you can That's have apparently a very low standard uh, in one part of the country and a high standard in the other. Is that? And that's why I think the, the federal government involvement in terms of making sure that even if the state agencies are doing it as an oversight, that there is some over, overlaying uh, uniform set of uh, criteria so that everyone uh, lives up to the same standards, I think, is a good idea. Uh, good, 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 good. I have just a few more minutes, I think. Could, could I ask, uh, I was astonished that bus drivers, uh, I, get, I, get, I guess I should ask you, uh, Chief, I was astonished that bus drivers were being uh, attacked, uh, apparently, um, uh, often enough so that, the, that a job action was, was threatened and that the attacks may be over, over fares. Could you explain what, what prompts these attack and what attacks and what you're doing to protect our bus drivers? Sure. So far this year, there have been approximately 22 to 25 assaults on bus operators. And they span from either 
spitting upon a bus operator, throwing a cup of water upon a bus operator, assaults with a weapon. Uh, the case that we had last week out at Capitol Heights was a mother who had a stroller and wanted to bring the stroller on. It is the policy of WMATA that you fold your stroller up for safety reasons. She did not want to do that. She decided to spit in the face of the bus operator and subsequently punched her. And so that was a situation that happens. Most of the uh, assaults stem from uh, fair, fair cases. Uh, people who don't want to pay the fare, and one would conclude that the bus operator probably has the most difficult job in transportation. They have to ask for a fare, deal with uh, people who uh, may not care for them, and then drive the bus while they're sitting behind them. And so oftentimes they may be the subjects of assaults. Uh, so we've been working with the, the various unions to come up with uh, ways that we can... Are there the more officers on, on the buses? Uh, the, the chief, our chief, spoke about how you need more officers, but when you see something like that happen, how does a bus driver know that he can go out and that he's going to be, he's going to get home in the next, uh, in the evening? One of the other things we're looking at is how to protect the bus driver. You can't have a police officer on every bus. No. So we've been working with uh, the union to come up with a shield that would separate the uh, bus driver from the, uh, the passengers. It's one way to pr provide protection to them. I regret that that has to be done, but you can't ask people to drive a bus if, if you're going to be assaulted and you don't know who's going to get on the bus to do so. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the general lady from the District of Columbia, and I want to thank the witnesses uh, Chairman, for. With your indulgence, could I? I thought Mr. Clay had a question. Oh, I did. oh, I'm sorry. The gentleman from Missouri. I apologize. Just real quickly, I won't take the entire five minutes. Uh, uh, Chief Tabor or uh, Mr. Griffin, in fiscal year 2011, Congress appropriated $2.2 billion for uh, FEMA state and local programs which include the Transit Security Grant Program and the Urban Area Security Initiative. Uh, for, fis for fiscal year 2012, President Obama requested $3.8 billion for the state and local programs. Earlier this month, the House passed the fiscal 2012 Department of Homeland Security Appropriations Bill, which provides $1 billion for state and local programs, or $2.8 billion below the President's request and $1.2 billion below fiscal year 2011. Uh, Chief Tabor, how would substantial cuts to the Transit Security Grant Program affect Metro's ability to prevent a terrorist attack? Any cuts in uh, grants would have an impact, but we cannot just think about this transit agencies, there's about 6,000 transit agencies across the country, many who are larger or who are in metropolitan areas, and we can selfishly want to make sure that we get all of the funds. And so the decision as to how they go about uh, assigning the grants based upon the risk and the assessments is a difficult one, but many of the programs that we want to move forward that uh, are based upon assessments that have been conducted on our system would sort of fall by the wayside. So, you know, we would encourage the funding of those programs to the, to the highest level. Thank you. And Mr. Griffin, uh, how would substantial cuts to the Urban Area Security Initiative affect the National Capital Region's ability to prevent a terrorist attack, including against Metro? It certainly would make it a greater challenge. Um, given my experience over the years, I have cautioned the decision makers um, on two issues. Uh, one, I think it's advisable to use the grants uh, to the extent possible on one-time acquisition, more capital-oriented, uh, so that if the grant goes away, you still have the capital and you're not building in operational requirements. Uh, the second guideline that I've advocated is that we should not initiate any program with the UASI funding that we are not willing as local governments to sustain. Um, and that's, that's been a tough message um, and not one that's always been adhered to. 
but the reality of it is for the process that we've just completed, there was an 18 percent reduction in UASI funding, uh, and that was handled primarily um, by Homeland Security by eliminating funding for the second tier UASI eligible communities so that the first tier communities could continue to receive the funding they had received the previous year. Uh, I would forecast that, that that funding is going to continue to decline, and I, we have to embrace our decision making that leads to continuing programs that we can sustain at the local level uh, once the funding disappears. And we are in the, in the Washington metropolitan area, second tier or first? Uh, we're first tier. Uh, we rank uh, fourth in terms of the amount of funds received behind New York City first, Los Angeles second, Chicago third, okay. um, D.C. fourth. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Missouri, uh, the gentleman from uh, Illinois. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, this is certainly my last question. Uh, Mr. Griffin, the Transit First Coalition has called on Vermont Board of Directors and member jurisdictions to look at alternatives to cut in services, knowing that something has to occur. Are there any other options that, that, that you might be thinking of that would uh, provide the opportunity to not cut services, but, but continue to provide those that are obviously greatly needed? I can only speak from the perspective of Fairfax County. In uh, Virginia, a substantial amount of the operational funding, uh, the operational subsidy that is provided to WMATA is actually provided by the local jurisdictions. Um, and so it is a significant consideration when I prepare a budget for my Board of Supervisors. Uh, we have over the years continued to support WMATA and have paid the county's share for both operational and for capital. Uh, and we see that as a very valuable investment. Uh, we do have to balance that against all the other um, activities that we have within the county. Uh, I am not advocating that we give more. Uh, necessarily, uh, what, what we do is we take a look, we take a balanced look at what our requirements are um, and, and what is desirable in the way of service provided by uh, WMATA. And that is not just the rail, it is also the bus service. Um, we look at uh, doing things collaboratively. Um, Fairfax County recently built a new uh, bus maintenance facility in the western part of the county, and we collaborated with WMATA. It is actually a shared facility. Uh, it meets WMATA's requirements, and it clearly meets our own requirements. We run a very large bus system as well. Um, so we look for collaborative ways to, to do business together uh, to enhance the service but minimize the cost. Thank the gentleman from Illinois. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona, Dr. Gozar. You know, my colleagues bring up a good, a good point. You know, as a business owner, you know, there's only a limited amount of, of money here. And so I want to ask the question, um, I think one of the major concerns from the GAO and the congressional uh, fellows in regards to budget is we got a problem and, and we want to know why the problem of not uh, where we have 80 percent of the funding not being used. Tell me, tell me uh, can you provide us why we have funding that in the estimates of almost 80 percent of the Federal grant dollars have, that you have received have not been used? Can we get a detail on that? Which grant program are we referring to? Uh, the unused security grants. Unused security grants. Well, I think there, and I will let the Chief go into the details, one of the issues is in that, in that particular case, I think we have obligated almost 100 uh, percent of the, uh, the grants. But when you look at the process, unlike the FTA, when you look at the process that is used by the agencies that provide that funding, it is a different process. It is a very lengthy process to get, uh, to, get to the money. And I will let the Chief go through uh, the details on it. 
I think as Mr. Sarles indicated, many of the grants that we have received through the Transit Security Grant Programs came to us oftentimes 16 and a half months into a 30-month program. And so they also come with requirements that we have to do environmental, um, uh, pre uh, his historic preservations. So there are a lot of different requirements, and oftentimes when we make applications for those grants, using the design and technology that we applied for, that technology may have changed. And so anytime that there's a change, we have to go back through the cycle, uh, reach back out to FEMA, and submit again. And so it is not something that's unique to this transit agency. I think you find the same thing with transit agencies across the country. Internally, we are working to do everything that we can in the most expedient manner to, to comply with FEMA, to comply with the Department of Homeland Security. But there, too, there is a, a discussion of policy, which policies to use and which guidelines to go through. And oftentimes, transit agencies are waiting to find out what it is that they need to do, because we would definitely like to expend that money. We have identified those projects. and. Uh, all of that money, as indicated by Mr. Sauls, have been obligated, but we have to adhere to the requirements of uh, FEMA or, in some of the grants, the state uh, administrative uh, office. So in, 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 in context, a lot of the problems have to do with who's got the jurisdictional aspects and, and the lack of a nimble federal government and agency review. Am I, am I speaking? Clearly? You're absolutely correct. Because I know I'm one of those people that actually had to sponsor a jurisdictional problem over two agencies over who had jurisdiction of a pipeline and who had the ground. Right. It's, it's, it's become um, um, obscene um, as a taxpayer, as a businessman, and as a citizen. Um, so, uh, Mr. Sarles, I guess my point comes back to you again, is, is that one size doesn't fit all. I heard a comment about, you know, having one set of standards. Um, one size does not fit all at all, does it? I'm not exactly sure uh, what you mean by that, but I want to give you a contrast in terms okay. of federal rules and, uh, and grant making. On the error grants, which is, I think we got $100 million, or might, maybe it was $200 million, we've expended two-thirds of that because the rules were different, the process for getting the money was different, and we were able to put it to, to work faster. And we see the same thing when you look at uh, formula funding grants from the FTA. Uh, the rules are different. We're able to get uh, through the process faster and be able to expend and get improvements from it. So to me, it seems like that we should be evaluating agencies based upon like a nonprofit, should we not? Because, you know, for example, uh, an agency like the Army Corps of Engineers where you have a $3 million grant and you, only $1 million of it actually goes to the services. Um, the administrative cost within that, two-thirds, is ridiculous. And so what we have to have is, is an agency that's much more nimble and working with local um, and state facilities to make sure that more of that dollar is actually spent and allowed you, the, nimb the nimbleness, to, to utilize it the way you see fit based on the conditions here. Because the conditions here are going to be a lot different than they are for me in Arizona, are they not? I don't know about Arizona, but I know here that uh, when we get the money, we uh, expend as fast as possible to get the improvements to our customers. Thank you. I want to thank our, our panel. Uh, Ms. Holmes Norton was gracious enough to take me to meet Chief Lanier, and then Chief Lanier was gracious enough to introduce me to her department, which uh, remains, uh, that visit remains one of the highlights of my first five months. So, Chief Taborn, I would I would love if, I don't know whether Ms. Holmes Norton would be willing to take me anywhere else or not. Uh, I think she probably will. She's very gracious. Anytime, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I would love if, uh, if she would uh, allow me to join her to, to, visit, uh, to visit you so I can know more about it and be a, a better advocate for, for you and your officers. Absolutely. So. We would be honored. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, again, thank the, the guests for uh, indulging us while we voted, and uh, we will be adjourned.